Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. Hello, and welcome to A Better Peace. I'm Jacqueline Whit. I'm the War Room Editor-in-Chief, and you're listening to the second part of a three-part roundtable podcast in which my guests and I take a wide-ranging tour of the theory of war and strategy. And we're thinking in particular about the distinction that is sometimes made between the nature and the character of war. So back in the winter when we recorded the podcast, uh, people had a few different positions. So at the time I was the podcast editor and Andrew Hill, who joins me on the podcast, was the editor-in-chief of War Room. Uh, And then we have Tino Perez, who is a faculty member at the U.S. Army War College and a political theorist. And then our fourth guest at the roundtable was Emily Knowles, and she is the director of the Remote Warfare Program, which is part of the Oxford Research Group. In the first episode, we started our discussion by thinking about the distinction that is often made between the enduring nature of war and the changing character of war. And as we left the last episode, Andrew was scolding all of humanity for being pretty terrible at entertaining multiple causal stories at once. So let's jump back in and see where the conversation goes next. Right. I think that's what we do in, in the schoolhouse. But we, are, not- we are demonstrably bad. I mean, and I, when I say we, I mean humanity, not just Americans. We are bad at entertaining multiple causal stories. Like we love, to your point about being comforted, right? Like it is so comforting to feel that you've cracked this issue. Like, oh, you know, this is just about people being disaffected because they don't have enough food, right? That that's, that's what this insurrection or whatever is about. And the world actually is very tolerant of, and in fact, features lots of situations in which you have multiple potentially complementary or mutually supporting, but, but in many ways, like sometimes even apparently contradictory causal stories. The competing and the sort of multivariant and multiple approaches, I think, is a thing that we have to think about sort of more carefully. At the same time that this nature character distinction is a comforting one, and I think, Tino, I think you're onto something there, it gets the, the flip side of it is also true, which is if you can make a claim, if you're a military professional, if you're a, a senior leader, if you're a four-star general officer, and you can make a claim that the nature of war is changing. And I think we're hearing that language more and more and more. It gets to some of what Emily was talking about, that novelty and um, and discontinuity is what's going to get you money, attention, yeah. resources. There's a marketing yeah. element. Intellectual here. sort of heft and energy behind something. And so the claim that AI is changing the nature of warfare is it doesn't even it doesn't have to be backed up in some ways it doesn't have to be backed up by any empirical evidence at all simply saying that maybe gets you gets you what you want yeah correct right and it usually comes against the backdrop of then a an ask for more money or more capacity or or creating a new institution that can look specifically at this problem and i think that you know i i'm I'm sympathetic to Andrew's view that in some ways theory serves as a way to create boundaries around, you know, what is our business and what isn't our business. And and it's useful for that to be able to distinguish, you know, what is warfare? What is war? What what are we looking at when we're talking about AI, for example? How does that change how we already understand how this particular thing operates? Um, but it's also it's really interesting to me to see how, as as you say, like those those distinctions can be exploited for different reasons, right? I mean, in the UK, one of the things that we have, which has proven really tricky in the past, is that we don't have any you know actual policy definition of you know what a combat operation versus a non-combat operation is. And we know this because we submitted a freedom of information request because we were like, do, does someone have one somewhere? Because it's quite fundamental in the UK because whether it's combat or non-combat determines whether it needs to be taken to a vote in Parliament Mm. or not, if it's combat or whether it doesn't because it's non-combat. And a lot of the ways that we're seeing the UK militarily engaged at the moment um, through support to local partners, through providing, you know, 
ISR support, training, advising, assisting, mentorship, all of that at the moment seems to fall under a bucket of non-combat operations. Despite the fact that as we analyze it, we're looking at it as a way of the UK to be involved in war, right? I mean, what we're trying as a to war do fighting. as a war fighting approach, right? If not a if not a strategy. So you kind of you find a lot of ways that you can operate within kind of I don't want to say gray zone any more than we absolutely have to but it, in those blurred distinctions between what is war what is not war can be used to either yeah. include or exclude the military from a conversation about a potential solution or what is combat what is non-combat will give you a very different idea about whether that's department of defense or our ministry of defense in the lead or whether that's department of state or our development agencies in the lead all of these things matter from a kind of institutional perspective and it creates a really interesting incentive when you get to the narratives around what are we seeing happening today for people to characterize something one way or another. Right. Um, just just as a way of carving out either this is an area that my institutional agency has a leading role in or isn't, depending on whether they want part of the solution or the problem or they don't. And I think that's that's one of the most fascinating ways that we see this stuff being used in terms of a narrative power um, within the military and defense at yeah. the moment. And I think those are questions that have to concern strategists, um, which is what we do here at the War College, um, right? Which is we talk about war, but we also talk about national security strategy. We also talk about um, sort of enterprise level strategic leadership. So the the meaning of words and what it is that is our business um matters. So I, I always teach the, the first class we teach in our department is the theory of war and strategy. Um, so it's all sort of right there in the title. And on the on the first day, I say I, to my students, I say that you're welcome to a philosophy class. We're going to talk about ontology and epistemology. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what that means. Um, but we're after understanding what is war, what is strategy, and how do we know what we know? So, Jackie, do us a favor things? and just briefly define ontology <laughs> oh, no. and epistemology. I feel like I spent the entire year of my master's program trying to get a handle on what was an ontological it's, and what was an fine. epistemological and then, question. I mean, they're, they're, they're not unrelated, right? And then after I do that, I make them draw pictures. Um, so I... I I don't, it feels like after that discussion was always the point where we'd but be like, we but need to take a break. But ontology is about the, the meaning, the essence of things. And epistemology is, is the science of knowledge. How do we know what we know? Great. Um, and so to me, those are fundamental questions that strategists must be concerned with. And so from that approach, I don't, I don't find the nature character distinction to be a useful one for the exercise, which I think we do need to undertake, which is ontological and epistemological. So you guys I'm read, gonna be fired. You guys read Sun Tzu, right? And and Sun Tzu and I realize Sun Tzu he never wrote a, a book exactly that had the title the the art of war, correct? Right? It like I mean it, there might have been a guy named Sun Tzu. There might have there was definitely some texts. Yeah, well we have to ancient texts, but I mean I'm I'm saying like was his did he have a work that was titled The Art of War? No, that's not what he would have called it. Yeah, right. So so but one of the things that's really remarkable to me about about him is that in this book that we've titled The Art of War, so much of what he talks about would not fall into a definition of war like the one you described, which is about violence, right? Where violence is this kind but of But even core. that one is only half of Clausewitz's definition. Yeah. So, right. so, so it's the, it's the he, half the military. Sun Tzu's right? obsessed with obtaining your objectives without like hazarding the uncertainties yeah. of battle, right? Like he's he's this kind of ultimate, you know, it's like Game of Thrones, the character in Game of Thrones with Littlefinger, you know, who's always trying to achieve his goals through subterfuge and, you know, avoid the uncertainty of, of battle. Battle seems like what the honest people want, you know, <laughs> and like all the dishonest conniving yeah. types want to achieve their their goals through through other approaches. But this, and, and so, you know, t to your point, he wouldn't have, you said Sun Tzu, that's not, he wouldn't have called it that, right? Like the ontology for him of conflict is way broader, right? Than it is for somebody like Jomini, right? Or, you know. Right. Well, they're writing about different things. I mean, and, and Kautilya is even probably a better example of this than Sun Tzu, who is, right, the, the Arthur Shastra um, is really about statecraft. Um, 
and war is only a little piece of it, right? And that's the that's where we get like war elephants and concubines and all sorts of stuff. So you can go listen to the the podcast I did with Larry Goodson on that. Um, we'll but embed we, a hyperlink for that but one. We, <laughs> but we teach that we teach that too, right? It's it's war is part of the state, right? The military is an arm of the state, which I think is really easy to forget sometimes for military professionals. Um, and I think that's something they've got to be reminded of. But we've we've got to delineate what it is we're talking about and what it is we're not yeah. talking I'm not, about. I'm not so insistent on the, the need to delineate. Uh, but I'm not emphatic about that either. Uh, one way to... Uh, here's, here's an illustration of how silly I think the distinction is. Between uh, um, nature, and, nature char- and, character. and character. Yeah. Let's say that you're going to apply the distinction to a man-made object, like a, like a rifle. What's the nature or the purpose of a rifle? Well, it's to launch a bullet, to hit a target that the uh, aimer intends. Okay, it's true enough, and it's also uh, useless. Uh, right, well, so is a crossbow. I mean, uh, I mean, yeah, in uh, some way. using gunpowder, you know, delineate what a bullet is. But that's not what's interesting about firing a weapon. Are you doing it, you know, as against uh, uh, a, a uniformed enemy in a lawful war? Are you doing it against uh, um, someone who's intruding in your house? Are you doing it as, a, as an act of uh, a violence in the street that's unlawful? Are you doing it, uh, is it being shot by a child soldier? Yeah. And those are questions about the human actors, right? <laughs> if we're supporting, you know, one side in, in Yemen, you know, what are the humanitarian right. outflows of that? And that's part of war. But doesn't it matter if, I mean, you said it doesn't matter necessarily if we delineate, but for... Now we're going to get ready to have a podcast about the profession. As a military professional, uh, doesn't yeah. it matter where where your lines of expertise are drawn, or because if everything is, I mean, to if everything is war and nothing is war and everything all gets in this sort of messy gray area, um, doesn't that make it more difficult for us collectively as a society to understand? what the military's role is vis-a-vis the state. So so I, that's a great point. And I don't know if Jackie or Tino or Emily, either of you'd like to take this up, but I, as a, f- a follow-on to that question, what is the tendency actually of the military in terms of how broadly or narrowly it kind of describes its domain of expertise, right? So, because that's not static over time. That Those... That I'm making like a circle with my hands and expanding and contracting it for the well, audience. The latest the uh, audio description. <laughs> the latest national defense strategy says that PME, pl- uh, military education, is weak in that it, it ignores or neglects lethality and war fighting. Right. So translate that for the audience. So, what, what is that telling us about the boundaries? Where do they need to go? So when I, when I read that, it sounds like the military professional's role, and it is this, we need to know how to, to use jargon from you know, the, the doctrine, organize the joint and war fighting functions. We need to be able to amass all the different equipment, the ordnance, the people, the systems in place to... to blow win, stuff up and to, kill people. To blow stuff up and kill people. Yeah. Now, here's the problem. Eventually, we have to engage in a civil mill dialogue. And four-star generals are going to be doing that, speaking with the Secretary of Defense in our system and then the, the president. And that ability to give military advice that is cognizant of the social political milieu in which we're going to intervene militarily isn't just going to erupt as a capability you know when it, when a general becomes say three or four stars it needs to be cultivated from the from the moment up from the from the beginning and and that's where the problem is we encourage younger uh, military professionals to only focus on war fighting and ignore the socio political uh, landscape where you're intervening and that's a bad habit to get by the time you're a three or four star. It's well, also, I, I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, I would jump in on that because one of the things that, that we see is is almost exactly the opposite of that problem, right? Where you had a tendency within the military over the last couple of years to expand ideas of what a military function was in a lot of the conflict areas where we're currently engaged. So to give you an example of that, um, in Afghanistan, for example, the idea of counterinsurgency and what was suddenly military business 
winning hearts and minds became became military business um which making, involves a lot of things which involves which involves a lot of things which which you could traditionally have said well that's a development function or, mm-hmm. or that's a diplomatic function or that that's not a a military functionality and i think what we saw was kind of a a real expansion at least in the military's idea about what the range of tools they needed in order to prosecute a military mission was in that sort of environment um and at the same time, you know, that that generated its own problems, both within the military of saying, you know, we've expanded too far. We're trying to do stuff that isn't a military capability. I can't have my folk e- equally worried about the kind of the, the very um, narrow kind of ordnance delivery, major war fighting stuff that Tino's talking about and also trying to affect a change in an Afghan Ministry right. of Defense by providing mentorship and civilian kind of oversight. And also over walk children to school for- and distribute yeah. funds and talk with the sheikh and right? sit down with the women. Yeah, and one of the things that we really saw when we were, when we were back there in 2017 when people were talking about, well, we were trying to talk about the military drawdown and the impact that that had had on the military's ability to achieve its own goals was that we were consistently reminded by the military personnel that it wasn't just a military drawdown. There's been a a major political drawdown uh, in terms of the development agencies, diplomatic actors that are out there in that space. So from where we saw it, the military were kind of grappling with this question of how much do we try and step in to fill the vacuum in capabilities Mm -hmm. that we see? How much of that is appropriate for us? You had General Mick Nicholson meeting with the Afghan president multiple times a week to advise on security strategy for the country that's that's quite a remarkable position for a military commander to be in if you if you think about it like direct sort of presidential advisory role um and i mean i I think we've seen pushback from this within the military itself especially within the uk where there's the questions of overstretch and and applicability but also within the kind of the diplomatic and, and development agencies who say you know how much of this stuff is being militarized how much are we getting too used to thinking of the military as the implementing partner in a lot of our strategies and actually the new stabilization guidance that um our stabilization unit which is a joint mod fco diffid so defense diplomacy development um, agency released just before christmas was basically like we know that you're all used to thinking about stabilization in terms of a military-led counterinsurgency tool that is one way that stabilization can take place but it's also not the only way that stabilization takes place we need to think about it as a as a civilian-led um operation to stabilize to reform um to work on a ministerial level and that's a that's an inherently civilian capability so i think that those those boundaries do do matter and they do shift and it's really fascinating to see Mm -hmm. how quickly they can shift um depending on a threat that we're faced with Um, And some of that's, you know, some of that's necessity, some of that's military filling gaps in capability that other agencies aren't providing. Um, But some of that is also mindset. And, you know, what is the role of the military? Is it appropriate for the military to be, as you say, sitting down with um, with local leaders or trying to support the the building of schools or or women's education? And is that what they are fighting for? so I think it's a really interesting question about where you place those boundaries and, and what becomes a military matter and what yeah. isn't a military matter, which I think we've seen the goalposts move on several times in the last decade or so. There's a there's a volume, I think it's a Senator of Military History put it out, the Green Book series. It's called Soldiers Become Governors. And it was yeah, written about World, uh, War World War II and how the, the U.S. Army struggled with how do we do military governance um, as we take over territory. And what... As early as 1942, Eisen, uh, Eisenhower discovered is that all my time is taken up with economic and political issues. When am I going to get to focus on war? And that was mm-hmm. true, if you read the book, about platoon leaders on the ground. Hey, there's no sewage here. People are trying to take yeah, it's control. it's about garbage collection. All it's that. about policing. It's about all sorts of things. So the benefit that we've got, you know, that we've had since 9-11 in 2003 has been an attention that these social political, uh, the landscape matters to war. And my worry is that we're going to forget about it. And if we envision war with a peer competitor, you can pick, you know who they are. And it actually happens, God forbid. There's no way that war ends cleanly. And just as Jackie promised, Tino's fun side comes out. That dark note seems like as good a place as any to end part two. Join us again in part three to find out what our gang decides about this vexing problem. If you've enjoyed this podcast and want to hear even more great content, subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite subscription service. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. 
The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.